uh, going to be looking this morning at the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And so, as we uh, continue in, as we prepare to, to uh, open God's Word together, I would invite you as you're able to stand. Uh, the words will be up here on the screen, but please feel free to turn there in your Bibles as well. Jesus is near the beginning of his ministry, and Mark writes here, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. If I may, I'd kind of like to take just a moment to pull back the curtain a little bit on how we do sermons, how we kind of plan them out here at our church. And we're still kind of figuring this out a year and a half in to having two locations. Probably always will be. Um, but usually, uh, Pastor Jeff Schultz, our senior pastor, preaches at the North Olmsted campus, and I, of course, will have the message here. Sometimes he and I will each select our own topic or our own series, and we'll talk about it some beforehand, but we decide what each of us will be doing. We're each going to do something different, and that's fine. Sometimes there will be a message or a series that he thinks it's important to share with the whole church to, to bring us together as an entire church. And so we have the sermon by video here, and that's also helpful kind of like last week when I'm away on vacation, to be able to, uh, to give me a little time away, quite selfishly. Um, sometimes we'll do a series in parallel, and we've done this before. We'll both take the same topic, the same main scripture passage, but we each kind of prepare our own message. We'll, we'll check in a few times during the week and kind of be moving in the same direction, but we kind of do our own thing with it. And the idea for this current discipleship series was supposed to be that, but because I was away there, we were going to do the series Offset, where I would preach on a topic a week after Pastor Jeff did at North Olmsted. He even said he would share his notes with me so I could use them as a starting point. Well, that was the idea anyway, until I realized a couple of weeks ago our schedule while we were down in Texas just wasn't going to allow me to prepare a sermon very well for last Sunday. So I emailed Pastor Jeff. I asked him, could we just share the message by video instead? Now, if you remember, we did that. And his message last week, do you, does anybody remember the title of that? I'm putting you on the spot here. Hmm? Balcony, people or Balcony people or basement people, yes. And he said, balcony people are those who build you up and encourage you. And basement people are those people who just bring you down. Well, when I asked him about 
using the video, I just mentioned kind of offhandedly, you know, when I first saw the title and read the scripture passage for that, I actually had his illustration flipped. I got an idea about who each group might be, and my idea had the basement people as our role models and the balcony people as the ones we should avoid. I thought it would be kind of funny if people had seen both sermons. You know, be balcony people, be basement people, and everybody would be confused. (laughs) And it only took him a minute to reply to my email, do the sermon by video. (laughs) And he added that there was a book, Balcony People, by Joyce Landorf Heatherly. He said it was pretty well known a few years ago, and it used the image the way that he did. Well, I looked it up. Balcony People was published in 1984. I chose not to remind Pastor Jeff how old I was in 1984. (laughs) We are a community of one book, and it is not Balcony People. Someone once described Christians as a book club that's been stuck on the same book for 2,000 years. That's certainly not the whole picture, But it's not completely wrong either. Acts 2.42 says that the first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And the word devoted means that they adhered to the teaching of the apostles. They stuck to it like superglue. It was so important to them because the teaching of the apostles was the teaching of Jesus. And today we have their scripture, God's word to Israel, which we call the Old Testament. And it was collected with the apostles' teaching about who Jesus was and what he taught. And we call that the New Testament. And together, they're the Bible. Here at Friends Church, we believe that this book is the word of God. We've been stuck on it for so long because we believe that it tells us how to be saved, what being saved looks like. But it's more than that. This book here isn't just an instruction manual for life. It's not just a legal text. It's a living story about how people messed up the world and how God was willing to pay everything to get us back. It tells us how we fit into that story, even today. This book here has within it the answer to overcoming addictions, to forgiving past abuses, to transforming attitudes, to dealing with temptation, enduring painful experiences, developing in-depth relationships, knowing God's nature and His will and growing in holiness. Jesus quoted the Old Testament when he said, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Mark tells us that the people were gathered in Capernaum to hear Jesus teach. They were hungry to receive the word, so much so that there was a large crowd gathered. Well, can I ask you this morning, are you hungry? For God's word. When a baby is born, if she's healthy, she craves milk on a regular basis. I remember when our kids were infants. They might crave milk at three o'clock in the morning, and they didn't mind letting us know it. And I didn't at all mind nudging Ginger to tell her that the baby was hungry. (laughs) Now, Wilson is a teenager. And we're seeing a whole new definition to hungry. We don't bother telling him not to snack before meals because we know he's not going to spoil his dinner. But the other day, he just took a little bit of food at supper time. And so what was it that we said to him? Hey, man, what's wrong? Why aren't you hungry? A lack of appetite is a sign that something isn't right. 1 Peter 2 says... Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
Peter says the word is nutritional milk for young Christians. But a lot of Jesus' followers have lost their appetite for God's word. And if there's one thing I've learned as a pastor, it's that we can't force feed people. I can't drag you to church. I can't make you come to a Bible study. You have to have an appetite for it. And you know, you can't just drum that up in yourself. You can't make yourself hungry. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is the secret. If we ask, the Holy Spirit within us will work in us, not just to act in the way that God wants us to act, but to want to act in that way. He can work in us not just to understand and grow in his word, but to want to learn and grow in his word. He will give us the hunger. But I think there's something else very important to understand. That crowd in Mark 2 was hungry. They were packed in tight in that house to hear Jesus. But then someone else shows up. He's a paralytic. He can't walk. He's completely dependent upon four friends who are carrying his stretcher. But they can't get to Jesus. Why? Well, because of the crowd. Remember what I said about how I had, had flipped the balcony and basement people? When I first thought of balcony people, I actually thought of the church that Ginger and I attended whenever we lived in Pittsburgh. It had about 3,000 people attending every weekend. And they had a big sanctuary, but it wasn't that big. So they had to have something like six services every weekend. Often, Ginger and I wound up sitting up in the balcony. That balcony was a place where it was very easy to feel present, but actually be disconnected. It was very easy to be just part of the crowd. And you, you know, you don't have to have a church of 3,000 people to be somebody who just sits in the balcony. Sometimes we think that because we went to church on a Sunday morning, because we were part of the crowd, that we have connected with Jesus. We were here, we sang, we listened, we left. But nothing changed. The crowd is one of the greatest things that can inhibit transformation that can keep us from authentic kingdom living, that can block up there from coming down here. So I ask, is the crowd keeping you from Jesus? Crowds come together for an activity. People come together to see a ball game, not to talk to you. There are work crowds, school crowds, and church crowds. Most of us are part of crowds almost every day. Might not be large, but if you think about it, a crowd has very little to do with community. It's kind of a pseudo-community, isn't it? Based on activity and superficiality. Because in a crowd, if somebody's talking to you, they, they might know your name, they might not, but it only really ever gets as deep as, hi, how you doing? And what do you say? Fine, fine, everybody's fine in a crowd. Everything is just fine. No one knows your struggle. No one knows where you hurt. No one knows your victories or your, your defeats. No one knows what you're going to do this afternoon. And no one really cares. So you're alone in the crowd. We can even come to this place with just two or three dozen people on a Sunday morning, and people can still feel alone. Now, sometimes that's the way people like it. They don't want to be known. They don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to take the risk of getting involved with someone else and someone else getting involved with them. 
You know, I don't need anybody. It's none of your business what's going on in my life. Though we might belong to the crowd, we're really still just in isolation. In fact, we're far from God, far from the community that He desires for His people. Because crowds can actually keep you from Jesus, the real Jesus, the transforming power of Jesus. No one is transformed by the crowd. And a lot of us mistake, make the mistake of looking at the church crowd and thinking that it's community. But as long as we're just hanging out in the crowd, looking down from the balcony, the crowd is actually going to block us, to block true transformation from happening in our lives. Now, sometimes we realize that, but we go to completely the other extreme. Well, if the crowd is just hypocritical and shallow, then the answer must be just to go it alone, right? Just me and Jesus. No. Because when we look at Mark 2, <clears throat> we see that that paralyzed man had four friends. Those friends went upstairs. They dug through that flat roof, gently lowering the man to the feet of Jesus. We don't have a basement in this church, and it's probably a good thing after all the rain that we had this past week. We might have an indoor pool instead. But the church I grew up in in Pennsylvania, we, we had a basement there. Now that church had a nice sanctuary with tall ceiling and beautiful woodwork, stained glass windows. In contrast, its basement wasn't much. It was kind of like this one. Had only a few narrow windows way up by the drop ceiling. And that ceiling was really pretty low. Had those old tiles on the floor that almost every church basement has, the ones that are probably asbestos. And it had, I remember it had a couple of shuffleboard targets carefully laid out on the tile. Now, for the record, I have never once seen anybody play shuffleboard on a floor like that, but they all seem to have those, right? But growing up, I remember that musty basement as the place where church really happened. It was where we gathered and lingered over a ricatoni and pretzel jello salad. It was where we had the annual Good Friday breakfast and where we packed shoeboxes to share Christmas with kids all around the world. It was the place for wedding receptions and funeral lunches. It was a place for friends. Now, I don't want to over-glorify it. There was a lot of the time that the conversations there were, frankly, pretty shallow. There were church parties where Jesus wasn't mentioned once after we said grace. Even the basement can become a crowd. But we find the truest experience of church when we get down out of the balcony, out of the ritual, out of the pretension, out of the crowd, and out of ourselves. Jesus said in Matthew 18, Truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. He says it's about two or three. It's not about crowds. But it's also not about lone rangers. And this is so important. Jesus lives in the intimacy of real community. There's a way that I experience the presence and healing of Jesus in the midst of two or three friends that I can't experience in a crowd, and I can't experience all by myself. There's a way that I connect to the power of Jesus only in the midst of two or three or five or six. And I can't experience Jesus in that way all by myself. Friends are the people who share and get involved with your life. They go beyond superficiality. They're invested in your life. And they carry you to Jesus. It's only through the accountability and of authentic relationships and community that we're really going to connect with Jesus and be transformed. 
So I would ask you this morning, who do you allow to carry you? Who knows the stuff that's going on in your life that keeps you up at night? The stuff that almost nobody else knows. Are you willing to be vulnerable with a friend or two or four? A group of friends who love you so much that maybe if they wake up in the middle of the night, they carry you to Jesus by praying for you, praying for the struggles that you're facing. Who carries you? Now notice the friends, they couldn't solve that man's problems, but they could carry him to Jesus. I think today's great counterfeit for this kind of fellowship that Christ wants to give his church, it's probably social media, if we're honest. It can be good. It can be a way to connect to family and friends when you live far away, or so I'm told. My Facebook account is what I call anti-social media. I set it up so that only friends of friends can send me a friend request, but I don't have any friends. So I'm basically unreachable. Every once in a while, I think that maybe I should open it up and connect with some people I haven't seen since college, but then I hear of somebody else getting their Facebook account hacked and sending crazy stuff to everybody on their list, or I hear what someone I respected is posting, and I just think, you know, I'm good. I'm good. Because for all of its benefits... Social media can deceive us. It promises us permissive, accepting, and inclusive fellowship. You can get people to affirm you for bravely admitting something that's actually really popular. You can share secrets with people who live in a different city or time zone or continent, secure that they're not going to tell anybody else you know. We have a desire to know and be known. And we're given the promise of that online. But in truth, it just pushes us farther from reality. It's just a counterfeit of the genuine face-to-face relationships that we were really created for. And it can suck away our time, blocking us from the real deal. But, you know, if we're honest, how often does the church really provide an alternative? If someone's husband talks about separation or divorce, where does she go? Maybe your daughter ran away to meet her boyfriend for the third time and she's no longer listening to you. Who do you tell that to? You struggle with the temptation of sin and you feel shame mixed with fear, who do you go to? Or maybe you were unwise financially and got into trouble, or you've just heard from the doctor and they want to do a biopsy, and where do you go? Who is carrying you? That's why we're moving as a whole church to emphasizing our growth groups. We'd love to see everyone in our church involved in a a growth group or a Wednesday evening Bible study or a Sunday morning prayer group. Some group where on a regular basis you're getting the opportunity to, to feed on God's Word together, where you can get to know one another and develop friendships that will carry you to Jesus. You know, we had a great response to our Thursday growth group here when we started it a couple of months ago. In fact, we've had nearly 20 people show up for our gatherings. But I realize there's actually a problem with that and an opportunity. Because as I told the group a few weeks ago, 20 people is really too big to build that kind of relationship. It's too big to develop that kind of intimacy. It's too easy for it just to become another crowd. So I said, I want, really want that big group to become two groups, or even three. I want to have groups that are small enough to really get to know one another, 
small enough to welcome more people in. Because we don't call ourselves crowd church. We're friends church. We need to be passionate about developing those vital, life-giving friendships where we can come together, study God's word, share together, talk, and in the midst of that, find that we've become friends. You know, that's a kingdom word. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I call you friends. Something important to think about. Jesus knew that he couldn't fulfill God's purpose. He couldn't be obedient through his ministry all the way to the cross if it weren't for his friends, for the authentic community who were carrying him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his crucifixion, he took his friends with him. And here's what he said. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Do you hear that? Jesus, the Son of God, is saying, guys, I, I don't want to do this by myself. I can't do what the Father is asking me to do tomorrow emotionally if you don't stand with me. Now, if you know, the apostles didn't exactly do it perfectly, did they? The reality is we won't either. As I was preparing for today, I found this drawing. It's by Alexandre Bita from 1875. It depicts the four friends bringing the paralyzed man to Jesus. What I love about it is, do you notice the ropes? They're hanging in midair. Looks like they just got the guy down about halfway and then dropped him at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> you know, the reality is we're all flawed people. I am, you are, we're living among flawed people. Sometimes people are going to drop us. And we can get jaded and shut everyone out. Or we can fall at the feet of Jesus. Fall at the feet of the God who is bigger. We can forgive one another. And keep carrying one another to Jesus. And let me take it another direction. Who are you carrying? A lot of people say... I don't need to be part of a group, you know. My life's really fine. For some reason, they fail to see that real Christian transformation calls them to be a friend to someone who's struggling. How much more, then, should you be involved in a group where you can be a help and a support to others? The reality is you might not feel that you need them today, that they need you, but this is life. You're going to need some, somebody else someday. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe this evening. Now to form more growth groups here, you know, that means we need more people who are willing to lead those groups or be a host for those groups. Now we will provide resources and some training and support but we need people who are willing to step out in faith, who are willing to say, yes, I may not do it perfectly, I may not be completely comfortable doing it, but I'm willing to let God use me. Back in the third century, St. Lawrence was Archdeacon of Rome. In that role, he was in the trusted position of maintaining the, the sacred vessels of the church, distributing alms to the poor. Well, this was when there was a lot of persecution. There was a lot of antagonism between the emperor and the church. And the emperor of Rome needed some money. So one day, he decided to go out 
and execute the Pope. He hoped that he would be able to get the stash of treasure that he thought the church had. So Pope Sixtus was killed in a cemetery while he was performing the liturgy for somebody else's funeral. Emperor Valerian was disappointed to find out that the Pope didn't actually have any treasure. That was the responsibility of the Archdeacon of Rome, Lawrence. So they took Lawrence captive. The emperor asked him, where is the treasure of the church? And he threatened Lawrence with the same fate that the Pope had received. Lawrence replied, emperor, I cannot get it for you this instant, but if you will give me three days, I will give you the treasure. The emperor agreed and Lawrence left. Three days later, he walked into the emperor's courtyard, followed by a great crowd of people. The emperor walked out onto his balcony and said, where is the treasure of the church? Lawrence stepped forward and he pointed to the people who surrounded him. The lame, the blind, the deaf, nobodies of society. And he said, emperor, here are the treasures of the Christian church. As Pastor Jeff likes to say, one of God's greatest gifts to his people is his people. We're supposed to hunger for his word, but we can't fulfill that in isolation. And we can't follow him truly just as part of the crowd, disconnected from one another. The people sitting next to you are of infinite worth worth so much that Christ gave himself up for her and for him. So this morning, will you commit to carry her? Will you commit to carry him? And will you let them carry you?